depending on where you live, there's a fairly good chance that the wastewater that flows out of your house and uh, goes to a treatment plant is disinfected, not with chemicals, but with ultraviolet light. I mean, there's, they do it both ways. Chemicals, you can always dose water with enough uh, sodium hypochlorite or bleach to kill uh, bacteria and viruses, but treating with chemicals is expensive because you have to use chemicals in proportion to how much water is flowing into the treatment plant. And uh, there's a lot of side effects sometimes. You, it'll change the pH, and so you have to add more chemicals to compensate for the uh, disinfectant chemicals you use. And uh, some, some treatment plants opt to go with UV disinfectant. So there's a lot of different manufacturers of UV uh, disinfectant equipment, but they all involve some sort of uh, fluorescent UV light element. And that's the one that's inside here. And then this tube is actually quartz. It's not glass. Um, they use quartz because with glass and the intensity of this UV light, the glass will actually start to discolor and start to block the ultraviolet radiation from getting out. So these tubes are arranged in a bank of, let's say, maybe 36 tubes in a rectangle. And they're, they're down vertically in the wastewater channel, and the water is flowing you know, across and around the tubes. And so if your channel is two feet wide and you have a two foot wide module of 36 lights, there is nowhere that the water can go and the bacteria can go without getting exposed to the ultraviolet radiation. And that just basically shreds their DNA and they become inactive. It doesn't remove them from the water, but they can't reproduce, so they're dead. So this technology, it's mostly electrical. It's based around a NEMA 4X box, which is stainless steel. And then uh, there's the array of tubes, and there's a framework that goes down and holds the bottom ends of the tubes. Well, in order to keep the quartz tubes clean, you have to scrub them. And so there's a wiper plate that uh, encapsulates all of the tubes, and it pushes these bristle brushes up the tubes and then down the tubes. That takes a couple pounds of force to do it. They've tried other things. This is a, a Teflon wiper with a stainless steel um, tensioning ring here. And you put two of these together. And the Teflon wipers have a sharp edge. And so they scrape the surface of the tube clean. Because what happens as the as all this wastewater is flowing on here, the, the bodies of these bacteria and viruses, they're, they're either sticky or they're slimy, and they build up on the surface of the quartz tubes and um, start to block the light, so it has to be wiped. Well, you take a couple pounds of force, three pounds of force times 36, and you're, you're all of a sudden pushing this wiper plate with a hundred or a couple hundred pounds of force. And that became a problem because what they, it was a couple of problems that we had. It's driven by a, uh, an acne screw, three quarter inch acne screw, stainless steel. And a couple things were happening. The, the acne screw and the nut were wearing out from the load from driving this wiper plate back and forth. And the, the acne screws were actually bowing when, when you would get towards the bottom end of the, um, quartz tube. These are actually about seven feet long and it had a little gear motor up at the top that's you know turning the acne screw but when you're pushing the wiper down you're putting the, the acne screw, this flimsy little acne screw in, in compression and so it would bow out and that would you know it would break the tubes. It, it just would cause all kind of problems. This was the device. It's a, it's a little weldment that they had bolted to the center of the stripper plate. I'm trying to remember which one was the actual production one, but we tried a couple of different things, and the, and the problem they were having 
um, with the with the broken, you know, the bending Acme screws and wearing out of the nuts. It, it was one of those, this is costing us thousands of dollars a day because, because we had hundreds of these modules in service. Any given installation might have, you know, 25 of them or 30 of them. And we had these in dozens of plants and they were failing in a couple months. And it was literally to the point where they could not rework them fast enough. We couldn't keep up with the failures. They said, something has to be done. Can you engineer us a solution for this? And um, I looked at this as, as two kind of separate problems. One was fairly easy in concept to fix. The Acme screw by the load table, you know, in the catalog was absolutely strong enough to carry a couple hundred pounds of load, but you can't push a six foot rod and, and expect it to stay straight. So I said that the Acme screw has to be in tension for both, both strokes. Now, that's a problem, because in order to put it in tension, we have to have something on the bottom of the acne screw, which is at the bottom of the wastewater channel, like a thrust bearing. And we had to tension the acne screw with this thrust bearing in order for it to stay in tension and be able to drive the wiper plate back and forth without, without going into compression. Well, I don't know if you know much about bearings, but they don't like to live underwater. So we had to make some modifications to the structure of the frame, which was, like I said, basically a stainless steel sheet metal contraption designed off of an electrical box. And I had to make gusseted quarter inch plates that bridge both the top and the bottom of this so that we could take that uh, tension load of the Acme screw. So we're pulling on this Acme screw between the top and bottom of the module. But we didn't want deflection, so I made these gusseted, quarter-inch thick um, bolt-in. Everything had to be bolt-in to, to be retrofitted. And they were just stiffeners and supports for the Acme screw. Then we had to come up with a bearing that could live underwater. And that was no easy task, so we decided to try three different bearings simultaneously. The first bearing we would try would be a commercial thrust bearing. Now let me tell you what a thrust bearing is for those of you who don't know. A thrust bearing cannot carry a radial load. This is a thrust bearing, it's not the one that we chose, but you can see that the balls are on the face of two hardened washers. And here just happens to be a guide post that's the same diameter, but you can, you can apply a tremendous load to this upper washer and the balls transmit the load to the stationary point. So we used a commercial McMaster. Um, it's, it's a thrust bearing with a, a steel cage around it. And in order to tension it, we had the end of the, um, the Nook Acne screw machined down to accept uh, what's called a bearing lock nut. I could get this out of its box. Looks like I'm going to have to destroy the box. These are commercially available items. And um, it just has a fine thread. And you screw it up against your bearing. And then we were actually preloading this about a full turn to put some tension on the, on the Acme screw. And we had a, uh, a shaft seal that um, was at the top of the bearing housing. And then what we did was we pumped the entire bearing housing that was submerged in um, with waterproof green grease. The thought was if we can keep the water out, then the bearing might last. So that was the first bearing that we tried, was the commercial thrust bearing. The second bearing, I wanted to make a homemade thrust bearing with very large uh, balls. We made this out of Amco 18 bronze. And this has six balls. They're half inch in diameter. But let me tell you what, this was a challenge to make because if you look at uh, the, the amount of material left between these, we're under 50 thousandths, we're about 45 thousandths 
between the uh, milled pockets for the balls. And when you mill the first one, it's fine, but as you mill the one subsequent, that little web would tend to want to deform and uh, go into the previous one that you milled. I wish I had ball bearings the right size, but you know these drop in, and then we had uh, 440 stainless thrust discs made, which are hardenable, and we had those hardened up to 62 Rockwell. So that was our homemade thrust bearing uh, option two that we hoped, because of the size of the ball bearings, if water got in, could run for a long time uh, without um, without failure. The coolest one, option three, was this little guy. And this was a spider assembly that uses commercial little 3 8 by 7 8 sealed bearings. And this was machined out of, I think, 316 stainless. And if you take a look at that, I'm wondering if people can tell how this thing was made. Because you had um, closely machined post for the bearing. You had a snap ring groove. You had a teeny tiny little snap ring to retain the bearing. And then this was held on the, the end of the acne shaft. And this would ride against a hardened thrust surface. So our aim on this option was to have a very cheap commercial bearing, three of them, and then a, a non-replaceable, you know, th this should last forever, but this, this was uh, very each sealed. And uh, we thought that one of these three bearing options would work out. Turns out we tested the first one with the commercial bearing and they simulated it with uh, corrosive water. Um, and when we pulled the assembly out after about a month of running continuously, we were cycling that plate back and forth continuously. Our little seal, which had a pressed steel cage, this, the pressed steel cage had completely rotted away. We said, oh no, you know, that's gonna, it's gonna be failed inside. We opened up the inside and there wasn't any water in there. The bearing was completely fine because that waterproof green grease completely encapsulated uh, the bearing and no water got in, it was fine. So we never ended up using the spider thrust bearing or the homemade ball bearing. Now, I have a couple of these and they're just too cool to not do something with. So I have a repurposed um, use for these that I'm gonna show you in an upcoming video. But in case you were wondering, these were made, you can see the centers here. These were actually turned. This surface and this surface are part of the same circle. So this started out as a round chunk. It was turned down to one inch for the set screw. And then they turned it, uh, put centers in here, and they did all of this lathe work to mill down and make a shaft stub and put that little snap ring groove in, indexed it 120 degrees, and they did that two more times. And that's how they made this. The shop that uh, made these, they're very good. I knew they could come up with a way to manufacture it. But that's the tale of three thrust bearings. Um, the other part of the experimentation that we had to correct was the life of the nut and the standard Acme nut by Nook. This was a molded piece. I think this is nylon. And we made some out of brass. We made some out of Ampco 18 bronze. These are both, and, and the Ampco 18 bronze didn't hold up. I don't know if you can see that, but the threads on that are wiped out. It just, it just stripped it right out. The one that held up the best was Delrin AF. And this is a Delrin AF, um, and the threads begin about an inch on either side. And we had this pressed into a housing, into the center of a housing, with a brass guide on either side. And that's what we ended up using to get the life of the lead screw nut to equal the life of the, the bearings. Actually, the bearings held up um, 
indefinitely. I don't think we've replaced those bearings ever. The, the nuts do wear out, but they wear out after a month or two of service and that was, that was acceptable. So that was how you know, the logic went in solving this problem. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. We will be using this on an upcoming video. You're going to laugh at what I'm doing with it, but uh, we're just going to have some fun. The other item I wanted to show you, a very, very nicely machined item, is this is a thrust screw for a different piece of equipment. And th these are all 316. But that's a 2 inch, 16 thread per inch thread. And, and this piece is actually TIG welded into a fabricated assembly. And then the mating um, jack screw with a 1 inch square to adjust it screws into that. And the shop that did this is Hall Industries in Fishersville, Virginia. And I mean, it is just, it is just beautiful. I mean, the, the finish they got on this thing and the, you know, nice fitting threads. I just couldn't be more pleased with, uh, with this piece. That'd be a tough one for any shop to make and, and make it that nice. So hope you enjoyed it. Um, more with the thrust bearing in an upcoming video. Till then, everybody stay safe, and we'll see you next time on Engineer's Workshop. Mm -hmm.